Summer League is here. Game one for the Pacers tonight. Their first of five in Vegas. What to watch for with some returning players and, of course, the new draft picks. What other players are worth keeping an eye on and plenty more I'll be tracking here from Vegas. I'll come in today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Friday. Congrats, you made it through the week, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, diving in to Summer League for the Pacers. Really love Summer League. Uh, basketball without stakes and yet still important players making progress it's just a really fun time for basketball and the NBA in general and it starts tonight for the Pacers who take on the Nets and their first of five games we'll break down lots of summer league related topics today the, the returning players the draftees some other guys just to keep an eye on on this Pacers team out here in Vegas I got here earlier today it is unbelievably hot so expect many puns about players when they're shooting well me saying oh they're shooting hotter than the weather out here because it's it's crazy team usa is playing canada's playing they played each other in the nemhard versus halberton bowl they scored a combined two points but didn't get hurt so a very uneventful i feel less bad about missing that as a podcast segment we'll talk plenty about halberton on team usa and nemhard on canada uh next week with people who are more in tune with those teams looking forward to that stuff today is all about the summer Pacers, and I'm going to start with the returnees, even though I think the guy that most fans will have intrigue in is Johnny Furphy, the highest draft pick, and I certainly will too because I haven't watched a ton of full-length Johnny Furphy games at this stage since they picked him. I'll have more time when Summer League is over to really dive in, but I think to me the place to start and the two most – Furphy is among my two most interesting players in Summer League, to be clear, but I think the guy that is the most interesting and probably the most noteworthy for the Pacers – out in Vegas is Jairus Walker. And there's just no doubt about it, right? A guy who is entering such a pivotal season for so many reasons. Three podcasts in a row on this show, kind of unintentionally, but just important topics to me about the progression of the Pacers. Jairus Walker has been a meaningful part of the discussion for some reason or another. Tuesday, I talked about Rick Carlisle's comments about Jairus Walker on 107.5 The Fan uh, earlier this week that were very interesting and revealing about how his focuses for Jairus this offseason were not about so, some random specific skills. We'll talk about the stuff he's mentioned in the context of Summer League, but more about conditioning, motor, all that kind of stuff, dominating games for a long time, and that matters for the Pacers. And then yesterday, or two days ago, we talked about the center position being in flux for the Pacers. Can Jairus be a small ball five? Is that a thing that matters for the Pacers? Yesterday was all about future finances for the team. You know what helps ease that? If they have a really cheap reserve forward who's playing every day and when rick carlisle was talking about jarris on the radio it near the end of the discussion he and he brought up so many things that this it didn't get buried that's the wrong way to talk about it but you know, he did talk about that if jarris is gonna play this season you know there's some stuff he's going to have to show and do in summer league to get on the floor and then it would be possible if he does those things to play in games for the pacers this year and the stuff he mentioned that was key were, of course, the stuff I already mentioned, motor conditioning, all that. Uh, I detailed that a little more on Tuesday's podcast. So I just want to listen to it. He talked about rebounding. He talked about physicality. He did not say it was about points. He did not say it was about passing. I will insert my own opinion that some of that stuff will matter to me, of course. But he mentioned that stuff and and just a general defensive ability. And I think for Jarris, that those will be the most important things, right? I actually thought that his offense was farther along than I expected in year one, and his defense was not as far along as I expected. Not that I have any level of concern, to be clear. I still think he's going to be a very good NBA defender with his feel and his tools. But I do agree with Rick that seeing him hit people, seeing him be mobile, seeing him be that kind of defender is going to be where I really am, am diving in hard to, to Jarris Walker. What kind of stuff can he show in that way, right? Can he be a game-changing force on defense? If you remember Summer League last year, Jarris was a lot of that stuff, right? It was really impressive to see him fly around the court and be a defensive playmaker and finish plays. Um, and I think that kind of stuff with a little more physicality, with a little more rebounding, 
uh, all that will be really fascinating to see. And on top of that, you know, just in general for me personally to step set past what Carlisle said, I would like to see some more on Bali reps from the wing. And we saw that late in summer league last year, right? early Matherin was around and Emhard was around. And then the next two games were more Jarris Walker focused and they were fine. I mean, he had some turnovers and stuff, but last year, for those who don't remember Jarris Walker, 14 points, 7.8 rebounds, 3.3 assists per game in summer league. But he had that uh, elbow issue and shot 34% from the field, 17.9% from deep. Good steal numbers, good block numbers, right? That kind of stuff will matter to me. But I want to see, beyond the stuff Rick said, because I do agree with him that Jarrah showing those kinds of things will be important. And I'm, I should add something that stood out to me going back through notes recently. Um, Quentin Jackson was talking about being the point guard for this Pacers group, and we'll talk more about him later. But something he specifically said about being a point guard for the Pacers and, and what mattered for him is, you know, if they're going to defend 94 feet and be aggressive like that, and if they're going to play organized chaos and fly around, you got to be in really good shape to run the show and be a part of this Pacers team and offense. And that matters for Jarris too. And that's why I think his offseason and doing this stuff with Jim Boylan for weeks and all that stuff mattered for Jalen Smith and Isaiah Jackson last year. It's going to be a big deal. So, so Jarris seeing efficiency on top of all the stuff, Carlisle mentioned will be important to me. Even if he only averages like 12 and six, if he shoots 50, if his splits are like 52, 38, 75, and he looks physical and in shape and rebounds, that's a great summer league, right? That gives you progress. That shows the stuff that for the Pacers will matter. And now if he's 20 and eight, and that, that's awesome, obviously. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's not a big deal, but the stuff that he needs to be doing for the Pacers and taking steps in key areas, that's what I'll be watching for with him. And he is by far the most intriguing to me player on this summer league team. There's a lot of guys who could have maybe smaller impacts or, you know, short, shorter term, or they're already a vet and I get what they are. Jarris, I just, there's a lot of intrigue for me and maybe even the Pacers about what this could look like. The other guy that's going to be a ton of eyeballs and very interesting that there's a lot less data points on because we've never seen him play for the Pacers is Johnny Furphy, obviously the rookie, the 35th overall pick. Jaronero Pargo likened his movements and style to Lowry Markin. And I'm sure that will go uh, way too straight into fans' brains. I don't think he was comparing them talent-wise. I think he was comparing the way they play. But Furphy does, I will say this, watching him in practices only, practices only, his shot looks really clean. He gets them up. He makes them. He moves really well and smooth. So I buy, I'm buy. i buying the jumper uh, from just that and his percentages in college. I can't wait to see his full tape. And I can't wait to see what he looks like with his team. It doesn't sound like when we were talking with players and coaches and media sessions that he was a starter, but there's been some pictures of the team doing practices and just given the jersey colors, it looks like he has been getting some burn with the ones. So I'll be curious what his role is, how often he plays, what he looks like. But what does he show at all? Like, what's he ready for in the NBA? Because he, he, as has been said by many, he's going to need to add some strength, right? But can he shoot it really well? Can he skate by some defenders? Is he just going to be a shooter early in his career? What kind of passing can he show? What kind of rebounding and defense matter? I, I have no feel for what those kind of skills are going to look like. And maybe he, shoot, he shoots awful, and then everybody has to, through gritted teeth, say, oh, summer league doesn't matter. And, like, it's obviously better to play well than not. And I'll get to those caveats to start the second segment. But for Furphy, I think, how does he fit in this system, right? We just talked about how Quentin Jackson talked about the demanding changes the, the Pacers' style requires, and it worked well for them. They had the best offense in the playoffs, second best in the regular season. That's great. They should keep doing that. But it's challenging, right? And so what does it look like for a new guy coming from college? What is Furphy actually good at? How does he blend in with this team? I don't know what to expect from him there. And I'm looking forward to seeing his debut uh, this week, he's the second most intriguing guy for me personally. One, because I have, again, no idea <laughs> what he's going to look like, how his skill set's going to translate. But also, this is his first time playing with a lot of these guys. And he is on the roster. He has a full contract with the Pacers, not a two-way. He's going to be with the Pacers this season. He'll certainly get some G League reps. But it, that's that matters a great deal. And, and his development and progression matters long-term for this team. He's a cheapo contributor for the next couple of years. He could be a part of a trade. He could be a part of their young core after they trade other guys. It matters how his career starts and how he looks. Given what I know of what he does, he doesn't have the kind of skill set that's going to dominate summer league. At least I don't think so. Maybe he just shoots lights out and that's great. Maybe he can slither past closeouts and look awesome. I am just intrigued to see how he looks, how he fits in, what this is all going to look like for him. 
uh, because I don't really know what to expect of him, but pretty good reviews of him in practice, both from the way he plays and what I've actually been able to see. I want to see how his jumper actually looks. But Jarris Walker, Johnny Furphy, to me, are the two most intriguing and, quite frankly, important players for the Pacers in the summer league session. I'm looking forward to seeing how they play and how they look. Tons of other guys of note, lots of returning players, some two-way contract intrigue, and other guys that should matter or have your eye in these summer league games. We've got to talk about all of them. But before we do that, we need to take a break so we can talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts. For your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's so simple to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. And we're back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Jump on over to some of the guys who played for Team USA uh, two nights ago. Halliburton was uh, filling up the stat sheet. Best plus minus on team for my money. Drew Holiday was the best player for Team USA. He was sensational on both ends. Very fun game to watch that scrimmage. Can't wait for the Olympics. FIBA basketball is my true fave. It's awesome. It's the best players. There's passion, emotion. It's a different style. Uh, but lots of guys on Team USA with intrigue. But I would say locked on Celtics. Hear about Derek White being named a replacement. Jalen Brown's tweeting about it. All sorts of stuff. Um, I should have said this off the rip. But here's a thing to note about Summer League. You know who was amazing in Summer League? A lot of guys who never, ever, ever became good NBA players. I remember thinking that Chris Dunn was going to be awesome from his Summer League. And I normally don't read into Summer League, but just the way he moved. And Chris Dunn's a good player. But just the way he moved around and scored so well, I just thought, wow, this guy's going to. This guy's going to translate. And then he wasn't that kind of player at all in the NBA. And again, he's good, but not as good as his summer leagues adjusted. And guys have had awful summer leagues that turned out just fine, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter so much the results of what happens. What you're looking for is skill, progression, all that kind of stuff. And obviously it's awesome if a guy comes in like Andrew Nemhard last year and it's just way too good for summer league. <laughs> and everybody knows is it two seconds into the first game. And then you know that this guy's, you know, clearly a contributor that would be fantastic but i don't read into the results so much like it's not it's not worth it that much and especially this year i i don't i don't know this for certain but uh since i've been covering the pacers i would say this is you know, their their top end talents fine but this is not the most talented summer league roster they've had since i've been covering the team so you know that you know how does that Playing to everybody. Like last year, Andrew Nemhard is setting everybody up, and Benedict Matherin is drawing defensive attention, and Isaiah Jackson's a five man. Like, you know, it, it helps everybody when that's the case. And they have they still have some good players playing, but that's that level, and they won't play all the games. So keep all that in mind throughout the summer league experience. That said, let's talk about some returning players that aren't Jarris Walker. Um, if Furphy does not end up starting, it sounds like the starting five will be all the returning guys. From last year. So Quentin Jackson at the one, Ben Shepard at the two, Jarris Walker at the three, Kendall Brown uh, at the four, and Oscar Shibway, of course, the big man uh, at the five. There's a bug on the ceiling. So if you're watching me on YouTube, I apologize for continuing to look up because I lost it while doing that ad read a couple seconds ago. Um, so that, that those guys as the starting five are all noteworthy. And I think a little subplot of Summer League to keep an eye on as we start with Quentin Jackson here is going to be the two ways for the Pacers because. Uh, they had drafted Tristan Newton 49 and Enrique Freeman at 50. And that's generally about two way draft range. They gave qualifying offers to Quentin Jackson and Oscar Shibway. They have an open roster spot, I guess, but, um, you know, what, is there an actual battle for two way spots here or is Enrique Freeman viewed as this post player and they just signed James Wiseman? Do they not need Shibway? Do they have enough guards? They don't feel like they need Quentin Jackson because Tristan Newton is, is a guy they just picked. Like, I don't know how they feel about all this stuff. And I would guess the draft picks have an inside track, of course, because they just picked them. But I don't know where the Pacers sit on this. And I think that the summer league games could matter for them. And Kendall Brown has a non-guaranteed roster spot. So he as well as a guy uh, I'll be interested in. So 
Quentin Jackson, I want to start with him. I think he is going to impress a lot of you. Uh, if you didn't watch the Mad Ends last year, you might not know much about him, what he does, how he plays, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, that dude can freaking score. He had a 19-point game in the NBA for the Wizards two years ago. He averaged 22 and a half ish uh, for the Mad Ants last year um, and was a decent passer, a little over five assists per game. He's not a great shooter. He's okay. Little little subpar there, but he, he can get to the rim and he can finish plays, man. He can move. He's slithery and he's going to be the point guard for this team. And I don't know that he's going to be like lighting up passes and flinging it around the gym and, and embarrassing dudes or anything like that, but the way he moves, the way he can score, I don't know if you guys are too familiar with him. He played in three games for the Pacers last year, and I think he scored two points the whole season. Like You probably don't have a, a huge impression of, of Quentin Jackson, what he, what he is, what he can do, but he is pretty good as a scorer. His first summer league with the Wizards went really well. His second one didn't go awesome. But I think on this Pacers team with the reps he's going to have, he's going to look really good. When he was talking to us, uh, after one practice, he said, I don't really care how much I score. Like, I want to show that I can be a leader and like run an offense. And I think that's a good answer. But I do think he's going to look like a very good score within the context of what this Pacers team is. And I, I, I'm going to have a take that he's going to look pretty good in summer league this year. He's got two years of NBA experience under his belt. He just had this whole playoff run. Maybe he doesn't. And that might be an indictment of where he's at. But, you know, if you, if you've seen this, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what he is. And this is going to be a theme for this segment with the returning guys. What new skills does he show, right? Is the scoring there? Does he show any passing improvements that weren't necessarily uh, in his bag last year? What else can he add to his skills? But I, I'm, I'm into what Quentin Jackson was for the Mad Ants last year. And I'll be curious what he looks like. Let's talk Ben Shepard, the two-guard man. He is going to be an interesting guy to me, too. Last year, if you remember Ben Shepard at summer, like a little over 10 points a game, 38% from deep. There were these signs like, wow, this dude can really move defensively. You know, the, the baseline for what he actually ended up becoming in the NBA. Um, it's really interesting thing about Ben Shepard because talent-wise, like he just started in the conference finals. Like he's the best, air quotes, player on this team, right? He's probably going to be in the opening night rotation for the the, the M NBA Pacers. And yet his skill set isn't the type of like, whoa, summer league dominant player, Ben Shepard. You know, he's going to do good things. Like, again, he shot well last year. It was clear he was at least a useful player. But he's not like blasting by guys off the dribble or creating all these shots. And so I think a solid summer league for Ben Shepard is just looking more mature and better than other guys. You know, oh, I can guard that guy and I can't be screened. And you create an open three for me, I'm going to make it. And he showed that last year even. Uh, but this year, I think very similarly, that's going to be important. Um, and, and with him, like with Jackson – you know, what new skills does he show, if any, right? Is there some of that, like one dribble after a closeout into a nice mid-ranger or a floater or, whoa, he just threw a one-handed pass to the corner or, you know, any sort of pick and roll anything. You know, just did Ben Shepard on a single pick and roll last year. You know, so all sorts of that kind of stuff will matter for him, but I already know what Ben Shepard is. I'm not, like, dying to see new skills from him. Um, Oscar Shibway. Maybe in this two-way mix as well. Although I'd probably rank him fourth of the four guys that I would say is in the two-way mix right now, uh, even though he had obviously a very impressive rookie season. But same idea, right? Anything new with him? You know, I, I know what Oscar Shibwe was. That dude could rebound better than anybody in the whole G League. <laughs> it might, maybe better than anybody in Mad Ants history, but his defense needs some work. His other skills need work. His play finishing could be better, right? Uh, General Pargo, the head coach of this team, talked about his passing looking a little better this year, right? So that'd be something, right? What other new skills am I seeing from Oscar Shibwe? Is his is he really well timed executing plays? Is his pick and roll as the roll man awesome? Is his defense better, right? You know, all sorts of that kind of stuff I think will matter uh, a great deal on the assessment of Shibwe and the progress he's made from year one to two. Kendall Brown, the fifth and final guy of the returnees to get to here. Man, this is this might be not nah, this is a stretch, but this is among the biggest 10 days of Kendall Brown's career coming up, right? Starting today. The summer league runs to the 20 seconds where I get 10 days from because he's got the the lightly guaranteed contract for next year, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And this summer league could be an important part of, of where that lands. Maybe it matters what happens in training camp, also, who knows? But they just drafted a guy at his position with 35 who got a contract and Jarris Walker's playing on the wing for this team. Like they have young forwards in the mix right now. And money flexibility could matter for them during the season. 
So what 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 is Kendall Brown going to look like in these games? You know, specifically for him, I think new skills will matter. Um, I always thought his defense was okay in the G League. Like he moves really well. He stays in front of guys when he's engaged because he's so athletic, right? The reason you you get infatuated with Kendall Brown if you're any NBA team is just like, holy cow, this dude is so fast. He could jump so high. What does that translate to skill-wise? What does he add in this summer league will be worth watching? Every returning player has the same kind of theme to me. What do they do better? The biggest one for Kendall Brown has got to be shooting. Can he make some threes? Can he make some jump shots off the ball? Because I know if he gets a lane to the basket, he's going to cut really well and, and, and finish. Or if he's in transition, he's a blur and he's going to run behind somebody and score. Like, I know this stuff. This is his third summer league, though. You know, can he show a jumper? Can he show a lockdown D kind of stuff? Last year, Kendall Brown f- played all five summer league games, 8.6 points per game uh, and four rebounds and made his threes. But he only took one and a half per game. But he made 42.9% of his shots from long range last year. Uh, and more defensive playmaking from him, just given his athleticism and size. I feel like his steal and block number should be higher than they are. So big 10 days for him. If he looks great, if he looks efficient, if he looks better than the rest of the field, that gives him a better chance to make the opening night roster and earn earn some money and get into year three in the NBA uh, after a big injury his first season. That's going to matter a lot. I think if he's a really rough summer league for the Pacers who could open up a roster spot to bring an event or bring in a different young guy, um, that would not bode well for his chances to make it to camp and continue to try to prove that he belongs on the roster entering his third season plenty of other guys to get to the draft picks and three guys that i want you yes you listener to keep your eye on in summer league who you might not have heard of or know much about entering this before we wrap up summer league preview here on locked on pacers though this show is sponsored by better help comparison is the thief of joy it's easy to envy other people's lives and it might look like they have it all together on social media instagram whatever but in reality they probably don't Therapy can help you focus on what you want instead of what others have so you can start living your best life. Therapy can be helpful for that, for example, and many other things like learning positive coping skills, learning how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just for people who have experienced major trauma or anything like that. So if you've been thinking of starting therapy before, you've got to give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockdownNBA. We're back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. Closing out the summer league preview uh, for your second listen. Not a lot of transactions really going right now. So locked on Suns, Josh Akoji. Uh, I believe that's actually how you say his name. Funnily enough, just got a new contract with the Suns, human trade exception. And man, oh man, is the Suns expensive. A $400 million roster when you include tax payments. And look, every time the Suns sign a player, like you could argue uh, just to get into f- some Pacers financing stuff before we finish this up. You know, if he, if, if Josh Akogi, I just said his name differently, um, costs the Suns $47 million in tax payments, which is the tax bracket they're in, it's something like that. You know, that's for every team that doesn't pay the tax, just that signing gets them $2 million in luxury tax. Like, it's insane how much money is going to be coming from the Suns and distributions to other teams. And that's why some teams, like the Pacers maybe, uh, might try to duck the tax this year and maybe next year. And who knows? Uh, that's why we talked about this on a recent podcast. Let's finish up Summer League with... Some other guys to keep an eye on. Obviously, uh, two guys I haven't na- mentioned that you all probably know, or at least I've heard their name many times. Tristan Newton and Enrique Freeman, similar to Furphy, but a smaller level because they're likely headed for two-way spot, although they could, if they play well, get on the roster. The Pacers still have an open roster spot. What are you? <laughs> what are you at an NBA level, right? Enrique Freeman, my God, are your stats incredible in the MAC? Can you rebound in the pros? Can you finish plays in the NBA? He talked about in its final season at college, trying to become a modern front court player, right? What does that look like? Can he spread it out at all? What's his screening? I'm really interested to see what he is because his stats look awesome, and yet he was still there at 50, right? What is Enrique Freeman? What is his NBA outlook? And Tristan Newton is the Tony East special. Big guard who can create, who's shown chops of shooting, obviously very mature and poised, two championships. Like, man, especially the the jumbo guards. Like, that's the kind of players I really like. And so... 
Does his size shine? Does his defense look like anything? Can he shoot it at this level? I'd be really interested in those two guys. Same kind of deal for Furphy. My notes just say, hi, how are you? Like, I don't know who you are. What can you do? What can you do in the NBA? You're a second round pick. Do you have any sort of thing that I'm like, yes, that is a long-term thing worth investing in. And then can you get better at other stuff? Is there something I can tell like, okay, like with Shibwe, rebounding, great. You can get on an NBA floor. What else can you do? Can you be better enough to be in a rotation or are you just floating around the edges? But to float around the edges, that's a good thing for a second round pick. What's that skill going to look like? Freeman and Newton, I'll be curious to see what that is. A couple other names to keep an eye on, and just an eye on for the Pacers, because I've already gone through, that's eight guys, right? That's a lot for summer league already um, that that matter, of course, that are in the, the sphere of the Pacers. Uh, Josiah Jordan James, he worked out for the Pacers in the pre-draft process. He told the Knoxville News that he got an Exhibit 10 with the Pacers, which means he either will be in training camp or like he said, Tominaga will get an Exhibit 10 for one day and then will get cut. But either way, that would mean if that is true and that's going to happen, that the Pacers would get his G League rights because he's coming out of college, so no one currently has them. And then he would be with the Mad Ants this year. So that's, of course, worth keeping an eye on if they're going to be literally in the Pacers organization this season. So perhaps he could be a guy that actually gets some burn in some of these games. Uh, he is really good friends with Aaron Neesmith from high school and Chris Middleton. They all went to that school uh, and trained together. They were chatting during that workout. It was the first Pacers draft workout. And Aaron Neesmith actually didn't fly out of Indy earlier because he wanted to see uh, his friend at the workout, which I thought was really cool. But like, there were a couple of guys last year who snuck in and played – you know, a bunch of those games late in the summer league process for the Pacers. You know, Eli Brooks, who's with the Mad Ants for a while, played three games last year. Ethan Thompson played three games. Like, I'll be curious if Josiah Jordan James is one of those guys because they have an agreement about him potentially being with the Mad Ants. Um, the other two guys that I wrote in my notes to keep an eye on because they've had past successes. Uh, Sam Safranik, I believe he just goes by Sam. He is Australian. He has no NBA experience. I think he played at Creighton for a year. But that dude put up numbers for the Illawarra Hawks and the Australian League in the NBL. And that's like a that's like a pro league. It's good, right? Uh, if he's averaging 16 and 8 in Australia, I, wrote, I believe he was in the initial 20. I'd have to double check this, but I saw this before. I believe he was on the initial 20-man Australian roster for the Olympics, and he didn't make the team. But I mean, he like looks like a thing. He's a post player. I'll be fascinated to see what level of player he can look like in this setting uh, and how strong – uh, he looks because you know, certainly his resume and stats look tremendous, uh, but I have no idea what he is or you know why he's never reached the M <laughs> the NBA before. Um, and his stats at Creighton certainly don't look like like anything fascinating. So we'll see what that actually ends up looking like. Uh, I do I can't find where I saw the the twenty man Australia roster that I thought he was on. I might be wrong about that, but I believe I saw that at some point. Anyway, even without that part, his resume looks impressive. Uh, Dakota Mathias is another one to, uh, I would like to put on your radar. Many of you listening are probably already like, Oh, duh, I know who he is. He went to, uh, he went to Purdue, a, a lot of local ties for Indiana and the Pacers. And he was a good Purdue player. He could shoot it really well. Though that team made the sweet 16, two years in a row. And he played in the NBA. That is his standout thing to note here is among this Pacers roster. We're talking about guys who are coming back from the Pacers or guys who have Good overseas experience. Dakota Mathias has two years of NBA experience. Like Quentin Jackson has two years, and that's it. <laughs> right? Kendall Brown has two years. Like he is among a, the vets of this team. I bet he's in the rotation. Uh, he could really shoot it. He did okay for Memphis and Philly in his 14 NBA games. And he originally, out of Purdue, ended up with the Mavs for his first season he was in the g league but he was in training camp for them that year so he played for rick <laughs> in that camp and uh mike weiner jenny busick etc so he knows the system he knows the coaching staff he has local ties he's good um i of course am very interested in that kind of player uh to see how they can kind of work his way back he's trying to get back in the nba so he's of course worth keeping an eye on and of course for you boiler people uh, I, I don't know if he'll be any good at the pro level or what this looks like, but Lance Jones from Purdue last year is on this team. Um, so him and Matthias have that connection. I wrote a story on that. I don't know how good Lance Jones will be in the pros. I have no notes about him for the summer league process, but in my guys worth other talking about section of my notes for this podcast, I put Dakota Matthias and in parentheses, 
also talk about Lance Jones. So um, Lance Jones, two Boilermakers on this team. Uh, but Dakota Mathias, with his NBA experience, I think is a guy worth keeping an eye on as, as potentially a floor spacer, kind of like Sage Vett. I think he's 29 or 28, so he's much older than the rest of this crew. So Summer League, it's here uh, tonight. Pacers Nets uh, in the Cox Pavilion. I'll be there. And then we will do a podcast. I'm here. I might as well. Uh, so tomorrow you'll get a podcast about game one of Pacers Summer League. Just about that. Maybe a little. If, if there's not enough eventful stuff, I'll do stuff on USA Canada for the third segment. And then we'll keep it to probably two segments per game after that, unless something dramatic happens. And then the fourth and fifth game, if anybody important or all the important guys bow out, those will be one segmenters. But there's lots to talk about with Summer League. The actual games. I love these games. They're so much fun. You learn a lot about these players, who they are, and what kind of trajectory they can be on. And I'm looking forward to it. Love being out here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. I'm on Twitter at Tony R. East, and the show is on there at Locked on Pacers. Or you can comment down below on YouTube tomorrow again, talking Pacers Net Summer League Game 1 Monday, uh, talking Summer League Game 2, some early takeaways, and then we'll get into some international stuff, a little bit more offseason stuff, depending on how the transaction cycle goes. So, as you know, lots of good stuff coming here on the Locked on Pacers podcast. Thank you guys for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you very soon.